This is the epilogue, book 12, epilogue. The return to earth. One quite short canto. <clears throat> Savitri has come down from heaven and landed on the earth. No? She's been taken in to the earth consciousness. Out of abysmal trance, her spirit woke. Laying on the earth mother's calm, inconscient breast, she saw the green-clad branches lean above, guarding her sleep with their enchanted life. And overhead, a blue-winged ecstasy fluttered from bow to bow with high-pitched call. Into the magic secrecy of the woods, peering through an emerald lattice window of leaves, in indolent skies reclined, the thinning day turned to its slow fall into evening's peace. She pressed the living body of Satyavan. On her body's wordless joy to be and breathe, she bore the blissful burden of his head between her breasts, warm labor of delight. The waking gladness of her members felt the weight of heaven in his limbs, a touch summing the whole felicity of things and all her life was conscious of his life and all her being rejoiced, enfolding his. The immense remoteness of her trance had passed. Human she was once more, Earth's Savitri, yet felt in her illimitable change. A power dwelt in her soul too great for earth. A bliss lived in her heart too large for heaven. Light too intense for thought and love too boundless for earth's emotions, lit her skies of mind and spread through her deep and happy seas of soul. All that is sacred in the world drew near to her divine passivity of mood. A marvelous voice of silence breathed its thoughts. All things in time and space she had taken for hers. In her they moved, by her they lived and were. The whole wide world clung to her for delight created for her rapt embrace of love. Now, in her spaceless self, released from bounds, unnumbered years seemed moments long drawn out, the brilliant time flakes of eternity. 
out wingings of a bird from its bright home. Her earthly morns were radiant flights of joy. Boundless she was, a form of infinity. Absorbed no longer by the moment's beat, her spirit the unending future felt and lived with all the unbeginning past. Her life was a dawn's victorious opening, the past and unborn days had joined their dreams. Old vanished eves and far arriving noons hinted to her a vision of prescient hours. So this is the last book of the poem we're starting to read today. It's one which Sri Aurobindo did not revise, give final revision. There are two books, the Book of Death and this one of the Return to Earth, which he left, we can say, half finished. And it is, as it says, the Return to Earth. Um, Savitri and Satyavan have been out of their bodies. They have wandered in the world of everlasting night and the realm of the double twilight, the twilight of the ideal and the twilight of the earthly real. And we, last time we finished reading the book of Everlasting Day at the in the middle of which the Supreme Lord grants at last Savitri's prayer for earth and men. She wants to bring the soul of Satyavan back to the earth and all those boons which the Lord was ready to give her, she said, not for me alone, give to me for earth and men. And we read the prophecy that the Lord gave about what this victory would mean for Savitri herself, and then the long prophecy about what it would mean for the earth, for the future of the earth, and how it would bring about the earthly life becoming the life divine. And then last time we read this beautiful picture of how she descends to earth, carrying in her heart the soul of Satyavan, until they come close to the earth, and the earth's gravity pulls them swiftly down, and then there's a moment of unconsciousness. So now, um, the first thing that we read is this return to consciousness, Savitri waking up again on the earth. Hmm? You will start, Rosa. Yeah. The return to earth, hmm. out of uh, abysmal trance, her spirit woke, lay, lay on the earth mother's arm, Unconscious breast, she saw the green clad branches lean about, guarding her sleep with their enchanted light, and overhead a blue winged ecstasy fluttered from bow to bow with high pe pitched call. Thank you. So, Savitri has been in a state of 
abysmal trance, extremely deep trance. Now her spirit wakes up and she becomes aware where she is. She is lying on the ground, on the Earth Mother's calm, inconscient breast, on the earth, on the soil. And she's lying on the ground in the forest, so when she looks up, she sees the branches, the green-clad branches. The branches themselves are gray or brown, but they're clothed with green leaves. Clad means clothed. Hmm? Those branches are leaning over her as if to protect her. They are guarding, or they have been guarding her sleep while she was in trance. They've been protecting her sleep with their enchanted life. Symbolically, trees always represent life, and a forest represents the life of the world. No? So these trees have been as if there's a magic spell. They are protecting Savitri. And overhead, a bird, a blue-winged ecstasy. That bird is full of bliss and delight, and it's fluttering from bough to bough, from branch to branch, with a high-pitched call. that uh, pitch is in music, no, there can be low pitch or high pitch. The calls of birds are usually high pitched. Yeah. Is it clear? Shall we go on? Hmm? Bhuvana. Into the magic secrecy Secrecy of the world, peering through an emerald lattice window of leaves. In indolent skies reclined, the thinning day turned to its slow form into evening space. Yes. So it's as if the sky, hmm? the skies are peering through the branches into the woods, into the magic secrecy of the woods. The skies are trying to see what's happening down there where Savitri is lying. Hmm? Peering means, can I see? It's something difficult to see. They have to look through this emerald lattice window of leaves. A lattice window is, uh, you know, there's a crisscross. You can't see in very well because it's the windows protected. So here it's the leaves that are making it difficult for the skies to see through into the secrecy of the woods. Hmm? Or it's the day, the thinning day is peering through an emerald lattice window of leaves. And that um, day is lying down in indolent skies. This indolence, laziness. I think it's not only the skies, but also the day. It's becoming tired and lazy because the day is ending. The day is turning towards its slow fall into evening's peace. It's the afternoon. Throughout the poem, Sri Aurobindo keeps us informed what time of day it is, what time of year it is. And uh, this is the day, this is the same day that we were at at the beginning of the poem when Savitri woke up. No? And uh, at noonday, um, Satyavan left his body. Death came and took his soul away. Now, as they return to earth, it's into the afternoon, it's past noon. The day has turned to its slow fall 
into the peace of evening. You wanted to ask something? Yes, I always wondered what indolent means. Is it like lazy? Yes, indolent, a bit so lazy. You don't care, like. mm -hmm. It's uh, not very dynamic, no? As you might be when you're, if it's a warm afternoon, <laughs> you don't want to run about much, you will enjoy that indolence, laziness. Uh, Martin. The breast, the living body of such a one, on her body's wordless joy to be and breathe, she bore the blissful burden of his head, between her breast's warm label of delight, the waiting gladness of her members felt, the weight of heaven in his limbs, the touch summing the whole felicity of things. And all her life was conscious of his life, and all her being rejoiced in folding his. Mm. So you remember, back to book eight, um, when death came to Satyavan, uh, Savitri sat down under a tree and took him into her lap, into her arms, and that's where he died. So now they seem to be waking up in the same position. Satyavan's head is lying on Savitri's breast. And she feels so happy to feel the weight of that living body. Her, her body feels joyful, full of wordless joy the joy to exist, the joy to breathe. And she's carrying this burden, the weight, the blissful burden of his head. It's on there between her breasts. And they, they are, the, the breasts move as she breathes, no? their warm labor of delight. It's so delightful to be alive and to have Satyavan with her. So as she wakes up more, this waking gladness of her members, the, the limbs, the different parts of the body, felt this weight of his body, and to her it's like the weight of heaven. It's so blissful. That touch sums up the whole felicity of things, the whole bliss of existence. And all her life, all the life in her body, in her, was conscious that he's alive. She feels his life. And all her being rejoiced, enfolding, embracing his being. Dana Lakshmi. The immense remoteness of her trance had passed. Human she was once more, near the sky. Yet felt in her illimitable change. Your power dwelt in her soul, too great for her. Your bliss lived in her heart, too large for ever. Light too intense for thought and love too boundless for girls' emotions, lit her skies of mind, and spread through her deep and happy seas of soul. Yes. So that immense remoteness of her trance had passed. All those amazing experiences in the other worlds, and then the deep trance as she came back to earth, that has passed, that far awayness. Now she's back. She's human. She feels her humanness again. She's earth savitri, the human savitri. And yet, at the same time, she feels within her illimitable change. There's no limit to that enormous change that has come within her. 
she feels that there's a power in her soul that's too powerful for earth. It doesn't belong to the earth, it belongs to other realms. And there's a bliss in her heart that's too vast and wide, even for heaven. Hmm? Light, light is consciousness, no? light too intense for thought, and love too boundless, too limitless for earth's emotions. All these things, this power and bliss and light and love, are lighting up her skies of mind, the higher levels of consciousness. And they are spreading through her deep and happy seas of soul. And a soul like an ocean, vast and limitless, with many seas. Manoha. All that is sacred in the world drew near to her divine facility of mood. A marvelous voice of silence breathed its thoughts. All things in time and space she had taken for her. In air they moved, but by air they lived and were. The whole white world clung to her for delight. Created for a rapt embrace of love. Yes. She's lying there feeling deeply relaxed, a deep passivity in her mood, in her state. But as she lies there like that, everything that is sacred in the world, everything that's holy and divine, approaches her, comes close to her. There's a silence, a marvelous silence, but it's as if it's speaking to her, breathing its thoughts to her deep receptivity, her passivity of mood. Through this tremendous tapasya that she's done, and the great journey that she's been through, she has taken for hers, she's identified herself with all things in time and space, everything in the manifestation. And she feels them moving in her. She feels that everything in the universe is living and existing by her, because she's holding them all within her. The whole wide world clung to her for delight, as if it's all been created for her loving embrace, for her rapt embrace of love. This goes back a little bit to the end of book seven, where we saw Savitri realizing the cosmic consciousness, and the cosmic spirit. At that point also, in the last section of the last canto of book seven, she was able to identify with everything in the universe. Maybe I find that, those lines here. She was time and the dreams of God in time. She was space and the wideness of his days. From this she rose where time and space were not. The superconscient was her native air. Infinity was her movement's natural space. Eternity looked out from her on time. 
But before that, there are these lines which tell how she's identified with the flowers, the life of tree and flower, the dream white of the lotus in its pool, and so on. The cosmos flowered in her, the whole universe is flowering in her. She is the bed, like the flower bed, in which it is all flowering. She was the single self of all these selves in the universe. She was in them, and they were all in her. So she's recovering some of that realization here as she wakes up on the earth again. Yes. Finding her soul is different from the one which she receives, no? Well, that was the final realization. She went through these three stages, no? There was the psychic realization and the spiritual realization and then this identification with the whole universe. So now all those things that in the course of her quest that she has experienced and realized, um, she's carrying within her now back to earth. This is the illimitable change that she feels from the time when she left her body and started on that trance. Suresh? Now in the baseless self <coughs> from bound. Unnumber here seem moments all drawn out. The brilliant time place of eternity. All meanings of the great A bird. A bird. A bird. From its right home. A earthly walls were radiant flight of joy. Born as she was here from form of infinity. Thank you. <coughs> so now she feels that herself is not any more confined to a body or even to a subtle body. Now her self is spaceless, it's so vast, it's not limited. It's completely released from all limits and boundaries. So this means that unnumbered years, years and years and years, not just the years of a single lifetime, the years of, of the, the creation, seemed like just moments, but they are long drawn out moments. And at the same time, they are brilliant time flakes of eternity, as if just little, uh, little flakes, little fragments of eternity, <laughs> full of light. These are these moments. And then her earthly mourns, her mornings he here on earth seem like outwingings of a bird from its bright home. That bright home must be the heavenly home that she has come from. Her earthly mourns, the time that she has spent here on earth, these are like a bird leaving its nest, flying away for a time. You know? Radiant flights of joy. But it can always go back to that home. You know? She's boundless, unlimited. Her, her form, her individuality is a form of infinity.
Sergei. Thank you. So this spreading out, this wideness, means that she's no longer absorbed in the moment's beat. That's our normal consciousness, no? We live from moment to moment. We may have hopes and we may have memories, but uh, the spirit is focused on the moment. No? But now, her spirit is feeling the unending future. And at the same time, it's living with all the unbeginning past. So there's no beginning, there's no end. She's seeing the past, present and future, all as one vast, unending uh, flow. And her own life was like, seems to her like a dawn, a dawn's victorious opening. It's what she represents, no? the dawn, the coming of the new light. So the past days and the days that haven't been born yet had joined their dreams. <laughs> Each day perhaps brings its dreams. Now the dreams of the past and the dreams of the future have come together. The memory of old vanished eves, evenings in the past. No? That's one thing that she's aware of. But she's at the same time uh, aware of those distant, far arriving noons, those bright mid-days that are coming. All these things are hinting to her vision, her, they're hinting to her a vision of prescient hours. She's looking forward at those hours in the future. Mm -hmm. Sri says, we don't belong to the dawns of the past, but the noons of the future. Mm -hmm. so, Savitri is the beginning of that series of dawns that will become the noons of the future. Lela. Supine in using bliss she may one, given to the wonder of the waking trance. Half risen, then she sent her gaze around, as if to recover all sweet trivial threads, hold old happy thoughts, small treasured memories, and weave them into one immortal day. Yes. So supine, it means lying down, lying flat. She lay, she lay there a while in musing bliss. She's just delighting in enjoying all this. No? She's surrendered herself to the wonder of a waking trance, a kind of daydreaming state. But then, half risen, as if she sits up a bit, she looks around, sent her gaze around, as if to draw together old trivial threads, connections to things that have happened in the past. Hmm? Old, sweet, trivial threads. They're not very important, but still they have a sweet significance. Old, happy thoughts, small, treasured memories. It says, perhaps sometimes in the morning we might do something like this. If there's no big hurry to get up, we might lie there gathering uh, these 
threads and small treasured memories. She's doing something like that, as if she wants to weave all these threads into one immortal day, one wonderful, unforgettable day. Sarojini. Edward C. Hilt on the paradise of her breast. Her lower chant into a featherless sleep. Lying link on infant spirit on one. Lulit loud, loud. On the porch of two cons consenting, consenting consenting walls. Yes. So even though she's begun to sit up, she's still keeping Satyavan on her breast, on the paradise of her breast. It feels like paradise to have his head there. No? her lover. He's still in this deep sleep, fathomless, bottomless sleep, as if under a magic spell. He's like a small child, uh, an infant spirit, unaware, lulled. That's what we do with babies, no? We, we lull them into sweet sleep. He's lulled on the verge, on the borderline of two consenting worlds. Maybe the earth and the subtle worlds that they've come from. Maybe that world of everlasting day. Hmm. Patricia. But soon she leaned down over her left to call his mind back to with her traveling touch on his closed eyelids. Settled was her still look of strong delight, not yearning now, but large, with limitless joy or sovereign last content. Pure, passionate with the passion of the gods. Mm. So. That's a change also, no? Now she's not yearning anymore. Now she's fully satisfied, no? And she wants to wake him up. She wants to call his mind back to her. So how does she do it? She very, very gently touches his eyelids. And Shobindo dis describes the way that Savitri looks at Satyavan. A still look, a calm look of strong delight. Now she is not yearning. Her look is large with limitless joy or some sovereign last content. A complete satisfaction that masters everything. That look is pure passionate with the passion of the gods. There's an intensity to it, but it's uh, a pure intensity. There's nothing uh, cloudy or distorted in it. It is not much, the passion of God. <laughs> Ah. Yes. Imagine how she gently touches and looks at him. Yes. Mila. The sky is still not its wings, for all was made an overarching of celestial ways, like the absorbed culture of the sky or complain. Heavens leaning down to embrace from all sides earth a quiet rapture of our security. Hmm. So, this is emphasizing the purity. There's no stirring of desire because 
what she feels in that moment. It's as if like a, they are being covered, overarched with heavenly rays of light, as if uh, Sri Aurobindo compares it to the way that the sky embraces the earth on all sides. Hmm? The absorbed control of sky on plane, on large <coughs> plane where we can see the whole sky, the whole hemisphere of sky. Heavens leaning down to embrace from all sides earth. So this gives a quiet rapture and a vast security. There's no feeling now that Satyavan can be lost or will go away. It's an absolute sense of safety, of security. Andrea, will you read? Then, sighing to her touch, the soft wing sleep, rose hovering from his flower like lips and flew, murmurous away. Awake, he found her eyes waiting for his and felt her hands and saw the earth, his home given back to him once more, and her made his again, his passions all. Mm. So this is Satyavan's experience as he wakes up. The sleep. In poetry, sleep is often imagined like a kind of small fairy with wings. No? So uh, Sri Aurobindo uh, describes it like that. She touches uh, Satyavan's eyelids, and the sleep that has been holding them closed flies away. <coughs> Soft winged sleep, off it goes. Rose hovering from Satyavan's flower like eyelids and flew. It makes a little sound as it uh, flies away, <coughs> murmurous. Sleep has to be murmurous because it sends us to sleep. You know, it has to make a soft, um, soothing sound. So Satyavan now is awake. He wakes up to see Savitri's eyes waiting to meet his. And he feels her hands and looks around and sees the earth again given back to him once more. And Savitri made his again, his passions all. They, it was as if they had been separated in that everlasting night. But that is all over now. Gumsun. With his arms, and so playing home <coughs> on the world. A living note to make a possession of words. He murmured with the escaping lips her name, and vaguely collected wonder heart. Hands has the rotary captive back, love chain. To be and sunrise words, O oh golden being, and casket of all sweetness, Savitri, Godhead and woman, moonlight of my soul. Hmm. So beautiful, no? So he really takes possession with her. He embraces her, locked around. <laughs> he won't uh, let her go. A living knot, his arms, to make possession close. And he's waking up and he's remembering something of what has happened. No? Vaguely recollecting the, all those wonders that have happened. He cried, whence, from where, where have you brought me back from? As your captive, chained to you by love, you've brought me back to you yourself and to these walls of sunlight. Oh, Savitri, you golden beam of light and casket. A casket is a 
precious little box that you keep precious things in. So he says, you, Savitri, you're a, a jewel box of all sweetness. You are Godhead, divine, and woman, and you are the moonlight of my soul. Michelle, you'd like to read? For surely I have traveled in strange worlds by these or aliens, the pursuing spirits, together with the state the gates of light. I have turned away from the celestial throne and heavens insufficient without thee. Yes. He's recollecting vaguely, no? So he says, surely I've been traveling in strange worlds with you, companioned by you. You have been a pursuing spirit following me. The two of us together, we have disdained the gates of night. If you disdain something, it means you turn away from it with contempt. We have, uh, uh, in some kind of victorious move, we have moved away from those gates of night. And at the same time, or at a later stage, I turned away from the joy of the heavenly beings and from those heavens of the everlasting day, those heavens which would have been not enough if you were not there. Heavens insufficient without thee. I think we have to stop there for today. Book 12 Epilogue The Return to Earth Out of abysmal trance her spirit woke Laying on the earth mother's calm inconscient breast she saw the green-clad branches lean above, guarding her sleep with their enchanted life. And overhead, a blue-winged ecstasy fluttered from bough to bough with high-pitched call. Into the magic secrecy of the woods, peering through an emerald lattice window of leaves, in indolent skies reclined, the thinning day turned to its slow fall into evening's peace. She pressed the living body of Satyavan. On her body's wordless joy to be and breathe, she bore the blissful burden of his head between her breasts, warm labor of delight the waking gladness of her members felt the weight of heaven in his limbs, a touch summing the whole felicity of things. And all her life was conscious of his life, and all her being rejoiced enfolding his. The immense remoteness of her trance had passed. 
Human she was once more, Earth's Savitri. Yet felt in her illimitable change. A power dwelled in her soul too great for earth. A bliss lived in her heart too large for heaven. Light too intense for thought and love too boundless for earth's emotions, lit her skies of mind and spread through her deep and happy seas of soul. All that is sacred in the world drew near, to her divine passivity of mood. A marvellous voice of silence breathed its thoughts. All things in time and space she had taken for hers. In her they moved. By her they lived and were. The whole wide world clung to her for delight, created for her rapt embrace of love. Now in her spaceless self released from bounds, Unnumbered years seemed moments long drawn out, the brilliant time flakes of eternity. Outwingings of a bird from its bright home, her earthly morns were radiant flights of joy. Boundless she was, a form of infinity. Absorbed no longer by the moment's beat, her spirit the unending future felt and lived with all the unbeginning past. Her life was a dawn's victorious opening, the past and unborn days had joined their dreams, old vanished eves and far arriving noons hinted to her a vision of prescient hours. Supine, in musing bliss, she lay a while, given to the wonder of a waking trance. Half risen then, she sent her gaze around, as if to recover old sweet trivial threads, old happy thoughts, small treasured memories, and weave them into one immortal day. Ever she held on the paradise of her breast, her lover, Charmed into a fathomless sleep, Lain like an infant spirit unaware, Lulled on the verge of two consenting worlds. But soon she leaned down over her love, 
to call his mind back to her with her travelling touch on his closed eyelids. Settled was her still look of strong delight, not yearning now, but large with limitless joy or sovereign last content. Pure, passionate with the passion of the gods. Desire stirred not its wings, for all was made an overarching of celestial rays, like the absorbed control of sky on plain. Heavens leaning down to embrace from all sides earth, a quiet rapture, a vast security. Then, sighing to her touch, the soft winged sleep rose, hovering. From his flower like lids and flew murmurous away. Awake, he found her eyes waiting for his, and felt her hands, and saw the earth his home given back to him once more and her made his again, his passions all. With his arms encircling hold around her locked, a living knot to make possession close, he murmured with hesitating lips her name, and vaguely recollecting wonder, cried, Whence hast thou brought me captive back, love chained to thee and sunlight's walls, O golden beam and casket of all sweetness? Savitri, Godhead and woman, moonlight of my soul. For surely I have travelled in strange worlds, by thee companioned, a pursuing spirit. Together we have disdained the gates of night, I have turned away from the celestial's joy and heavens insufficient without thee.